Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 458 of the podcast and I am back in Bath currently recovering from an intense trip to Las Vegas for the Business Masterclass with Dean Wesley Smith and Christine Catherine Rush and I'm going to do a whole show on my thoughts about the Masterclass and on Vegas. (laughs) Uh, For now I'm just recovering from my um, jet lag which is always significant with Pacific time and also letting, I need to write up for my many, many pages of notes and get my thoughts together before sharing them with you. It's always great to have a podcast to or a blog to share thoughts post-conference with because it makes you get things in order. Uh, otherwise, notes just sit in notebooks. <laughs> so yes, I will be sharing that with you. You can see some pictures of me on the strip at uh, on Instagram at jfpenauthor if you want to have a look at those. So today I'm talking to Vikram Chandra, author of Sacred Games, about his journey from book to Netflix series success. Uh, and if you've seen Sacred Games on Netflix, you'll you'll know um, about a bit more about it. It's just fantastic uh, Indian show. I, I'd say Indian thriller you know, crime show. Um, As well as we talk about how Vikram manages his cross-cultural life as he teaches in the USA and also has a home in Mumbai. And we talk about the software he has created to help other people writing epic stories with interweaving plots across multiple timelines, which I know many of you do. And it is one of those things that can be very hard to manage. So that is coming up. And uh, I'm also hoping to get Vikram to come back on Books and Travel to do an interview about Mumbai. So keep an ear out for that as well. So in publishing and book marketing news, quite a few things that are interesting this week. Uh, One thing that is fascinating, given the focus on audio that I've been doing, um, and especially the interview with Jules Horn, when we talked about writing for audio, you can now pitch to Audible directly. And they are looking for original works crafted for the listening experience. They want single and multi-narrator stories, scripted, multicast work and audio documentary. Um, And this is definitely something I'm interested in because I want to write an audio drama probably adapted from one of the screenplays I've written. I think writing for audio first is really interesting because you can do much uh, bigger stories, but you don't need such a big budget because obviously you don't need the visual effects. Uh, So you can find that. um, uh, Links in the show notes, but basically audible.com forward slash EP forward slash audible dash pitch. I will put that in the show notes. Um, But yes, you can pitch to Audible directly. Written Word Media have released uh, a survey on how to make a living with your writing based on a survey of over a thousand authors. Um, And it's a really interesting post. Uh, Again, link to it in the show notes or go to Written Word Media. Um, Basically, those people, those authors making over $100,000 a year have at least 28 books in their catalogue. They write for 30 plus hours per week. They use professional editors and professional cover designers and they use free as a promotional technique and although some use Kindle Unlimited others do not so it is not a requirement. So I really like this uh, article and uh, it's nice to have some I guess some proof or some evidence and it's a great survey. Uh, Essentially there is no magic bullet and I mean I think the The original idea behind 20 books to 50K is the same thing, which is if you have 20 books, you can make $50,000 a year. Um, I've certainly seen that in my own writing. 
even without being a master of marketing, uh, which uh, I'm certainly not, um, then you can make 50 to 100k once you get past those 20 books. And once you have 30 books, 40 books, 50 books, and I know those numbers can sound a bit crazy to people. But what you I think what they haven't uh, done with this survey, or at least I didn't write it down, uh, was how long people have been writing. So I met some people on the masterclass who were quite new in the game. And although they are, you know, have a business mindset, they might they don't have the backlist. And at this point, I've been writing for 13 years. So for me to have 32 books, or whatever it is I have right now, um, that's not extraordinary, <laughs> actually, for people who've been, you know, writing over a decade, um, then, you know, you can you can get these numbers of books. And as I say to people as well, if you're starting in a new career, how valuable are you in year one? So if you start any job, uh, whatever job you start at, let's say you're a teacher, in your first year of teaching, are you that useful? Are you good at your job? Are you worth a lot of money? No, you're you're not. In any job, in year one, you're you're learning. In year two, year three, yep, you're still learning. You might be getting ahead of some people, but you're still learning. By year five, you you should be getting pretty good at your game and making some more money. By year 10, a decade in any career, you are valuable and you have experience, you will be making more money. And in many careers, um, after a decade, uh, certainly in the corporate world where I come from, making a hundred thousand US dollars after a decade is, you know, would be considered quite normal. So I want us to think about it that way. The writing career, yes, we are special. Yes, we are snowflakes, but uh, we are also in a career path like anyone else. And there are business things you have to do. There are money things you have to do. There are hours you have to put in. You have to create product, all of those things. And uh, yeah, so it, it, it is a career like any other. So I like the fact that this written word media survey really does underscore the fact there is no magic bullet. There is no... Um, faster way to make a sustainable living as a writer. And if you want to do this, then just, you know, long-term thinking, create your books, put them out there, just, you know, do the work basically. And if you enjoy the work, then it's the best career ever. And I enjoy the work, so I shall be carrying on. <laughs> okay, uh, what else? Drafter Digital have added audiobooks to their universal book links, which is fantastic, something I've been asking for for at least a year. Uh, so you can now, um, if you go to your books to read.com and you can now add audiobook links. Now, if you don't know what this is, basically, um, when you're sharing a link to your book on social media, what link do you put if you publish wide? And Books to Read answers that question. You can just share a Books to Read link and it will the user can choose the store they want to buy from. So it's very useful for sharing one single link to multiple stores. And Findaway Voices have announced five more distribution partners for audiobooks. So you can now reach 43 library platforms and audiobook stores through Findaway. Now, I this was another thing I was shocked to discover at the Business Masterclass. Some, um, you know, some writers who thought that Audible was 90% of the audiobook market. It is not. It is more like 40% of the audiobook market. They do a very good job uh, in the Amazon ecosystem of making you feel like they are everything. But um, as much as I love Audible and I am an Audible customer myself here in the UK, uh, if you look at the global audiobook market, um, it's more like 40% with many other stores dominating in other uh, countries around the world. So with Findaway, you can access uh, many of these partners, 43 other library platforms and brands uh, if you go wide with audio. I particularly enjoy having audiobooks in libraries. And remember, it is free to listen to audiobooks and to read ebooks if you get them from libraries. And you should be able to order my audiobooks from libraries and also my ebooks. You just have to request it from um, the librarian and they can add it to the catalogue. And then the wonderful thing about Findaway is this pay per checkout model, which I think is kind of game changing, um, which means that instead of a library having to pay one big whack of cash, for um, to put an audiobook or ebook in their catalog, they essentially um, can pay a micropayment per checkout. This is the type of thing that is 
kind of revolutionary for library lending, ebook lending, and um, audiobook lending, the paper checkout model. And it's something you cannot be part of if you're on Audible only. So um, obviously I did an episode oh, a while ago now on exclusivity and how to go wide for ebook, print and audio and uh, find a way are uh, certainly my chosen partner. I go with ACX for Audible and then I also go on Find a Way. So uh, you can find that update on the Find a Way Voices blog. And uh, in futurist stuff, just quickly, if you're into the AI stuff, the artificial intelligence, um, I did a full episode on that, but then I did an interview talking about it with Yaro Starak, who um, runs, uh, you know, has, has been my sort of mentor on the entrepreneur's journey for many years. And Yaro is a kind of a skeptic about much of the stuff I talk about. So he grills me and we have a good in-depth discussion about, uh, it's, I mean, it's a really long discussion. It's a couple of hours. Uh, so if you want to listen to us talk about AI, go over to yarrow.blog um, or search Yarrow, Y-A-R-O, on your podcast app and you'll find Yarrow's podcast and my interview with him, which would have been, uh, yeah, October 2019, essentially, for that episode. So my personal update, as I mentioned, I will do a whole show on the Business Masterclass and uh, I am uh, tired and you can hear with my voice I got sick, um, but it was really well worth going to and I had a bit of a aha moment, uh, which is always and why I go to Dean and Chris is because they are, they've been in this business for 30 plus years and uh, together they've written like I think they've they've got like a thousand books between them. It's just crazy. So, um, and I love to learn from people who have had a long term career in this business because the business keeps changing and they are still here. And that's um, I th- I hope that's how you see me as well, which is things keep changing and I'm still here. Um, a lot of people were talking at the masterclass about how some of the early people of indie have disappeared, um, come and gone, or, you know, people who did a certain uh, sales method have disappeared. And uh, I hate, I'm still here. <laughs> I started out indie, I'm still indie, I'm still podcasting. Um, so who knows how long I shall go on. Um, but more likely, I will change the creative pen uh, over time. Um, but uh, I am still here. So, <laughs> uh, but yes, that is, uh, so that's coming up probably next week. So uh, early November, early to mid November, I'll do a show on that. What else I have? Right, I have three books coming in German uh, next week as this goes out. Um, So very excited about that. I'm not going to be you know, aiming to do a massive launch for those books. I'm going to put them out. I'm going to get some reviews. I'm going to use KU, as I've mentioned. Um, It's very difficult to market in another language. So I'm going to use KU at first, um, use Amazon ads and see how that goes Um, and maybe do some Facebook ads and then I'll start doing some podcasts in Germany but obviously I'll be speaking in English (laughs) and uh, I do have the successful author mindset on ACX for German narration so my German version of the successful author mindset is there so if you are a German audiobook narrator or you know an audiobook narrator who has my kind of energy uh, my energy when I'm not sick (laughs) then um please let me know or you can look on acx.com for the project now um ACX obviously can be used if you are a narrator. I, I mean, I've had a couple of auditions already, so certainly there are some German narrators out there. Um, so uh, also, if you read German and you would like an advanced copy or you would, you know, if the book's alive, if you just like a review copy, please email me, joanna at thecreativepen.com. I'd love to uh, send you something. And also, I am in a fiction story bundle this week, with, uh, which is curated by Dean Wesley Smith. And I wanted to mention it because both Dean Wesley Smith and Christine Catherine Rush and Mark Leslie, uh, who, Mark Leslie Lefebvre, uh, who was at the masterclass previously known as Mark from Kobo uh, now known as um, what did he say Mark to digital because <laughs> Mark is now at Drafted Digital um, but uh, 
This is called Saving the World. And Dean says it has as many ways as possible to save the world and as many worlds as possible to save. This is a multi-genre bundle with thrillers, fantasy, sci-fi, short stories and more with a couple of exclusives in a pay-what-you-like deal for a limited time. Go to storybundle.com forward slash action, storybundle.com forward slash action, and uh, you can get a ton of books, including my own Destroyer of Worlds, uh, which actually, which uh, ties into this show because it's set mainly in India. So uh, that's pretty cool. And then in useful stuff, we are into NaNoWriMo. And uh, I'm, I kind of woke up this morning, I'm recording this on the 1st of November. And I woke up this morning and I went, oh dear, I cannot possibly start NaNoWriMo today because I have all this post masterclass stuff I need to do in order to clear the decks. Like my head does not, I cannot switch easily from one to the other, especially post um conference. So I'm going to start a few days late for Nano <laughs> and I'm going to, I'm working on the book three in my Matt Walker series, um, which is called uh, Map of the Impossible. And uh, I am a discovery writer. So either it is book three in a trilogy <laughs> or it is another book in the series. Uh, so we shall see. Um, but I do have dictation as a secret weapon. So I'm confident that I will get 50,000 this time. Now, I've never done 50,000 for Nano. In fact, I don't think I've ever done 50,000 in a month. I think I my limit has been about 43,000 in a month before. And uh, in Nano, I've done sort of 20,000. So uh yeah I'm confident I shall put some words down sometime in November so if you are joining me for Nano then right on I do have a couple of things to help you first of all if you go to the Kobo Writing Life podcast uh KWL podcast link in the show notes I have done a special edition for KWL uh, it's a special audio on five tips to help you write a novel in a month. And that is up on the KWL podcast. Also, I have a promotion on Kobo. You can get my three book writers uh, toolbox, which has the successful author mindset, how to market a book and how to make a living with your writing on Kobo only um, for 50% off. Or you can also uh, get the successful author mindset in audio on Kobo 50% off. Just use um, the promo code KWLPODPENPENN at the checkout link in the show notes. So basically you can get um, special 50% off uh, my stuff at Kobo. Also, my productivity ebook uh, is in the special NaNoWriMo box set at storybundle.com forward slash nano, N-A-N-O. And that also includes lots of other cool books on writing. I know that is super useful. I've actually reading a number of those myself. And finally, uh, very exciting. This will save you money. Uh, the um, Ingram Spark special promo code Get your pens ready, my friends. And again, this will be in the show notes. And I will mention this again. You can use promo code. So this is in caps, N-A-N-O 2020, N-A-N-O 2020. Um, this is a promo code for Ingram Spark. You can get free title upload on print books, ebooks, or both with Ingram Spark. And I use Ingram Spark for my print, my uh, large print, my hardbacks, uh, and it's usually 49 US dollars. And this is free. This is brilliant. This is the special code. Uh, they often put one out around this time. And so Ingram Spark, use promo code NANO2020. And so go get your books, my friends. <laughs> Right. Thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments. Just a couple today because I know we're getting on for time. Thanks to Noah Elowin, who is a Latino indie from Argentina. And of course, I gave a shout out. I wondered where all the Latino indies were. So Noah emailed me and uh, says he's using Instagram um, to mobilise readers. Um, but as far as he knows, there's no Latino indie community. Um, so if you do know any Latino indie uh, resources, please do email in. And I do think that that is a community that must be on the rise because this is a huge underserved market at the moment. So um, 
As I said, you know, indie really is only starting to take off in many communities and countries. So very exciting times. If you are uh, a Latino indie, you are in the forefront. So yeah, be excited that you know what you're doing. <laughs> uh, Marion Hill, who who I played a snippet um, from Frankfurt, said, your interview with Michael Anderley was probably one of the most important podcasts you have done so far on The Creative Pen. You and Michael have different indie publishing philosophies and it's great to hear you both speak on those differences not in a combative way or my way is the correct way type of manner thank you marion and yes i've had quite a few comments about the interview with michael um you know uh, many people agreeing with michael's point of view many people agreeing with my point of view but it doesn't matter and that was also interesting at the masterclass in that there was an acknowledgement that at this point there is no correct way. I mean, a few years back, there really were specific ways that you would self-publish and get your book out there. But now it's just expanding, expanding, expanding. So um, glad you enjoyed that. Uh, and then uh, finally, Jacqueline Rowe did a tweet. She said, grateful for recent episodes of The Creative Pen, cautioning us to edit with audio in mind. A sentence including the words sewing, soil, set, sorceress and sisters will now be modified. <laughs> and of course, with me reading that aloud, you can tell the problem. And unless you read your work out loud or check it for audio, you won't understand these things. And that's why that audible pitch thing that they um, mentioned actually specifies in their pitch page that it um, is an original work crafted for the listening experience. And uh, the listening experience is a different one to the reading experience. Okay, so today's show is sponsored by Readsy, the marketplace for curated professionals to help you edit, publish and market your books. Uh, what I love about Readsy is it is a curated marketplace, which means they actually vet everyone who is on their service. Uh, so if you go to Readsy to check out the professional editors, book cover designers, marketing professionals, ghostwriters, website builders and more, uh, you will know that they have been vetted and checked. And this is really important in a time where um, there are so many service providers. Again, like a few years back, there were not enough service providers and now there are lots and lots of them in certain areas, of course. Um so yeah, I really like recommending Readsy and they also have a free manuscript formatting tool, the Readsy book editor. They also have free courses on all the stages of writing, publishing and book marketing. So very useful. Check it out at thecreativepen.com forward slash Readsy, R-E-E-D-S-Y, thecreativepen.com forward slash Readsy. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing of the show. But my time is sponsored by my wonderful patrons. Thanks to everyone supporting the show on Patreon. You continue to be one of the reasons I continue to do this. <laughs> Thanks to new patrons, Chris Kane, Blake Atkinson and Ange. I really appreciate your support. Like the tweets and emails, it demonstrates you enjoy the show and want it to continue. You can support the show with just a couple of dollars a month and you get the extra Q&A audio. Uh, there's also a backlist audio, so you get lots more stuff to listen to. Um, specific Q&As about your uh, publishing business, your author life, uh, and I answer questions on writing, as well as... Um, publishing, book marketing and making a living with your writing. And I get quite personal in my answers because it's private <laughs> or it's private, uh, you know, a small community anyway. <laughs> so you can support the show at patreon.com forward slash the creative pen. Oh, I didn't do my thing. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash the creative pen. <laughs> Just in case. <laughs> right, let's get on with the interview with Vikram. Vikram Chandra is the multi-award winning author of Red Earth and Pouring Rain, which won the Commonwealth Writers' Prize for Best First Book, as well as Sacred Games, which has been adapted into a successful Netflix series set in Mumbai. Vikram teaches creative writing at the University of California and is also the CEO of Granthika, a software startup that is reinventing writing and reading for the digital age. Welcome to the show, Vikram. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. 
Oh, it's so great to have you on the show. So first up, tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing. Well, uh, I was a spectacularly nerdy little kid. (laughs) (laughs) I I had a life inside my head uh, that was very active. So I used to make up these stories, uh, and some of them were quite epic. They would go on for weeks and months. Um, And then, uh, of course, once I could read, I started, uh, I became an obsessive reader. I was always trying to get money off my mother and father to buy books. Um, And I should say also that my mother is a writer. Uh, And so some of my earliest memories are of seeing her at the kitchen table um, writing um, plays for radio and television and then later films. She's had a very successful career in the film industry in India. Um, so writing stuff, stories down was something that seemed just ordinary, right? Like there's, here was this person doing it in front of me. Uh, and I got my first uh, story published when I was 12 in the student run school magazine. Mm. And, and that was the, you know, that really put the, the, the bug in place because I suddenly had a larger audience than my friends and family and people seemed to like what I was doing. Although it was also very clear to me because I'd seen the paychecks that my mother got for her work, that uh, making a living from writing was next to impossible. Uh, so some, I mean, quite often now I wake up and I think, you know, it's miraculous that I've actually done this uh, <laughs> <laughs> and managed to still keep doing it. So how how did you go from there as a, a child? Because now, obviously, you're teaching creative writing and you've got these award winning novels. So just just to give us an update from your childhood stories to, um, you know, winning the Commonwealth Writers Prize is, is incredible. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So so um, I kept writing and, and I kept uh, I finally became the editor of my school magazine and uh my college magazine. And at the same time, especially during my teens, I really got, um, I loved, I found this love for American literature, right? So everything from um, Melville to to Edith Wharton, Hemingway, Fitzgerald, Zora Neale Hurston. And it had this faraway glamour also of, of being a place where I wanted to go. Um, and so I, I uh, I finally made it over to the States as an undergrad, and I majored in uh, English with a minor in creative writing and fiction. Uh, And then uh, after I got my BA, and I suddenly realized more than ever that I had to make a living, I had a moment of panic. (laughs) (laughs) saying, How how am I going to get by, right? And so since my mother was already involved in the film industry, and I was, um, I I love movies, I, I incessantly watch films and uh, television, I thought, well, here's an industry where I can at least get a job, right, Uh, as an assistant to an assistant director or something. So I went to film school at Columbia, and there were two things I discovered there. One is that I'm not exactly built well for hugely collaborative work. (laughs) (laughs) I know the feeling. (laughs) Right. And and also in the library there, um, just by chance, I happened upon this uh, the autobiography of uh, an a British Indian soldier named Colonel James Skinner, Sikander Skinner, he was called in India, who was part of that first uh, clash of cultures in the 18th and 19th centuries in India. And I started to get obsessed with with his life, and I knew I couldn't make a movie out of it. What I, I had in my head was way too big and epic. Um, so I dropped out of film school and went off uh, to um, to the university uh, to to uh, uh, a couple of writing programs and got my MFA and an MA and wrote my novel there, um, which I was very grateful for, especially for a couple of amazing teachers. I had John Barth and Donald Barthelme, who was incre- who were incredibly gen- generous to me, and so that's how I managed to get my first book written. And then, incredibly enough, it found an agent and a publisher, and that was it. Yeah, and it's a brilliant start. And we're going to come to Sacred Games um, soon. But I did want to ask you because, and it's so funny because you said, you know, America had this faraway glamour. And I think when when I certainly, and when many people think of India and Mumbai uh, and Bollywood, I mean, talk about faraway glamour. Most yes. people think that is more glamorous. It's always the other side of the fence, isn't it? It's always like, oh, that's more glamorous than my my country. <laughs> Right, absolutely, and then and then you know 
I also had the arrogance of the young person that I thought I actually knew the United States before I got here. <laughs> and when, you know, when you get to the, this place that you always dreamed of, you find that it's more unknown and complex than you could have ever imagined. Oh, and the same is true of India, for sure. I've been a yes. couple of times and it's it's like just dipping a toe in. But But this is interesting to me because I think I mean, you do seem truly bicultural um, in that you live between the US and India and you, um, you know, you obviously your families uh, across both countries. And so I wondered um, what, how has this bicultural life impacted your writing? But also, what do you see as some of the differences between the two markets, particularly for, mm. for, for writing? Ah, interesting. So I think... Um I talked about Sikandar Skinner, whose whose father was a British soldier. His uh, mother was an Indian uh, woman, a princess, uh, who was captured during a war, apparently. Um, and so, so I think right from the beginning, I've been in, really interested in these coming together of cultures and nations and people, and both the creativity and also the destruction that comes out of all of that. Um, and then I think in relation to India particularly, uh, what fascinates me also is language and how languages travel across worlds and change. Um, so India right now, by most estimates, has 125 million people who speak English. And that number is expected to quadruple over the next decade, which means that, that at some point fairly soon, India will have the largest number of English speakers in the world. Um, and the English we speak there uh, is not American English or the Queen's English, it's Indian English, or actually many Indian Englishes because they're local variations. So there's a Mumbai English and there's a Tamil English and so forth. So one of the efforts while writing Sacred Games was to use a language that I would use in a bar in Bombay if I were telling a story to a friend of mine, uh, which means that I would be switching in and out of three languages maybe at the same time. Uh, so to replicate that on the page while you're trying to tell a story about uh, cultural seepage, if you want to call it that, globalization, is some of the, is one of the things that I've tried really hard to get close to and have had a lot of fun doing uh, over the course of all the books. Yeah, and that's so interesting. And I want to just come back on that English speaking um, idea because I've said this many times on the podcast, but um, the English speakers are also many of them will be educated and uh, potentially middle class and book buyers. I mean, I've always been impressed by, you know, Indians love books, right? There's, it, there's right. A, a flourishing um pirate book market, let's say, with print yes. books on the streets, you'll find, you know, lots of people selling yeah. books on the street. But that's lovely because people want to buy books. So yeah. um, would that so would that be true about the English speaking market that it is more middle class with some money to spend? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it, right now, especially it is. Uh, it, it, you should. All, I mean, I should also note that it is, um, depending on which year you look at it, the largest growing economy in the world, uh, which is uh, I mean, the fastest growing economy in the world, which is why uh, publishers from all over the world have set up offices in Delhi over the last couple of decades. Um, and so uh, I think, though, that that as the middle class grows, as more and more people move into the living class, English in turn is moving in all directions in the so up the, and down the social ladder, as it were, um, so that everyone, even at the very bottom of the economic scale, everyone understands that this language is what gives you leverage in moving yourself up, right? Mm. So I've been to some of the most remote parts of the country where there are hardly any roads, there's electricity isn't working, and yet every four or five miles you'd see a little classroom, two-room, two-classroom school uh, that says learn English here, right, mm. in, in the local languages. So there's a great impetus for the language to sort of um, spread and and. Um, and, and also, as you said, the pirate industry is enormous. I've had kids at traffic lights sell me my own books. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I love. You've got to encourage that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, I mean, not to encourage piracy, I should take that back. Mm -hmm. But right, it's, it's at least a sign that, like you said, people want to read and, and there's a demand for these things. 
Yeah, exactly. Which which is what I meant as well. And also, if you can't stop it, it's good that it's your book, <laughs> well, yeah. someone else's. But let, let's come to Sacred Games now because um, I haven't read the book, uh, although it's on my list. But I've been watching the thriller, the series on Netflix. Now, mm. a couple of things. But so we started watching it in English, but then um, found the found that I just didn't want to watch it in English. So we we watched it in Hindi yes. um, with English subtitles, which I think. I think a lot of people are now doing with Netflix and subtitles to me don't really matter. That right. just it just happens and it just worked well that way. But I just found it very interesting that you have a protagonist who is a Sikh policeman. Um and I wanted to ask you that first of all about um is it is that unusual to have a Sikh as a main character and maybe you might just have to explain a bit more about the religious melting pot of India. Right, right. <laughs> Right. Um, so uh, I should say about the, the the subtitle issue. Yes, I would encourage anyone who does watch the show is to uh, is to watch it with subtitles and the original soundtrack. You'll get much more of the actor's performance also that way. Um, and on some people's machines, uh, for reasons that remain mysterious to me, uh, it defaults to the English dub. And which I would not recommend. Yeah, right? that's what we got. And I was like, I'm not listening to this. This is weird. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, yes, exactly. And I mean, as you'll see in, in the original soundtrack, you'll see people speaking different languages, right? Sometimes mm. like even one sentence will have uh, words from three different languages in it. Um, and and uh, as for the issue of uh, Sartad Singh, um, the lead uh, being a part of the Sikh religion, um it's uh, uh, in Bombay, in the police force, that would be very much a minority, right? If you went up to Punjab um, or the north, that would not be the case at all. So uh, in retrospect, I can say that in making one of the protagonists of the book uh, of this religion um, served, very, served me very usefully because he could be, he, he was an outsider in this police force for those reasons. Right? Um, and having a, a protagonist who's in some ways an outsider is, I think, fictively often very useful, right? And you can see it deployed, this technique deployed over a large bunch of fictions. But I should say that uh, I can say this only in a kind of post-game analysis, because when I started writing, the character just came to me, mm. right, as, mm. as he or she often does. Um, he first showed up in a book of short stories called Loving, uh, Love and Longing in Bombay, which was the book before Sacred Games. Um, in which I thought I would try to write a police procedural because I love them so much. Um, and as soon as I started thinking of that, I had this policeman in my head who had a turban. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, and I have no idea why. Uh, but once that happens, once you get that initial sort of spark of inspiration, you can find ways to use um, whatever you start with. Um, I mean, and again, I can say that, uh, I, again, looking back, I guess I could sort of try and unravel this a bit and think about all the friends that I had growing up who were six and, and um, uh, the name of this character came, comes from a, 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 a boy who was, I think, three or four senior, years senior to me in school. Um, he, he's, uh, especially in that short story, he's very handsome and he's turned out he's a bit of a dandy. Uh, and I can think of characters in my life who were like that. And I guess that's the fun and mysterious thing about writing is that all your experiences mixed together in this strange chemistry and then you know, suddenly pop up. And yeah, then, no, that's yeah. completely right. I have. The, I mean, I think we all have that same thing. Of course, they're never recognisable completely, but <laughs> we just yes, weave, yes. weave them together. So I also want to ask you, I mean, like you, you started off by talking about when you were a child and you had these epic stories in your head. And I think this is something that is very um, characteristic of Indian stories is that, you know, there's some very famous, mm. very, very long epics that yes. um, are in the religious literature, but also modern fiction. I've heard um, people are writing sort of serialized fiction that can go on for a long time. And so Sacred Games, I think, also has this aspect of um, obviously the policeman and the, and the big criminal. Um, their, their past lives are kind of weaved together into the story, into the present, which again, feels quite epic to me. So I wonder if you would comment on the differences in storytelling um, between the cultures right yeah no i think you're absolutely right we've always had this love for length uh, <laughs> uh the ramayana and the mahabharata which are the two epics at 
the core of the culture and have been immensely uh, influential across all of South and Southeast Asia over the centuries are immensely long. Um, and, and, um, and I don't know, I mean, I don't know if I can work up a sort of good uh, analysis of why that is so, but it's always been there. And those of you who've seen Hindi movies or any movies in other languages from India, uh, you know that some of them are three hours long, um, sort of by by default, uh, although they've started to become a little shorter over the last decade or so. Um, so so, and I don't. When I first started writing my first book, Red Earth and Pouring Rain, uh, that turned out to be six hundred pages. So, um, I think it's always been my natural length, sort of. Um, and I'm immensely jealous of people who can construct little miracles of storytelling in two pages. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and, and what poets do is completely um, crazy to me. Um, and and uh, I, I read a lot of very short, short fiction and poetry, but I can't do it. Um, and so one of the other significant um, markers of, of fiction in the subcontinent has been there's a couple of them. One is this uh, circular um, uh, shape to them, right? So the Mahabharat starts um, uh, with somebody sitting down and starting to tell a story to another person, and then the entire immensity of it happens, and then you end up in exactly the same place. Um, and and there's actually quite a bit of scholarship devoted to this obsession of uh, circular shapes, right, of circles within circles. Um, and that's something that I found particularly useful in writing Sacred Games. Um, uh, I was a few hundred pages into the writing of the book, and I was despairing of finding a structure for it. And then suddenly, one morning, I had this idea, oh, this is a mandala. So you might have seen the mandala. It's a, in Buddhist and Hindu and other iconographies of the of the subcontinent and the far east there are those uh large figures in which um say the life of the buddha is represented in several panels that fit together to make a kind of circle mm -hmm. often with a central panel at the at the at the core showing you the most important bit of that story and, and so once i knew that then i could construct the entire novel in that way so so it winds its way around to the beginning uh, the things that seem mysterious at the beginning um, also then make sense at the end. Uh, and I should say that in the Netflix series, the writers have and the showrunners have done an incredible job of um, replicating or recreating that structure. Um, and then I think the other major part, which certainly has had an influence on in me, is uh, stories within stories, right? Frame stories. So you can have a character start to tell a story like in the Mahabharata, and then a character within that story that he is telling will start to tell another story. And then you can keep sliding down, right? Stories within stories within stories. <laughs> and it's dizzying and great fun, right? Uh, so after Red Earth and Pouring Rain was published, a Spanish scholar who was doing some work on the book told me that at the deepest, I had gone down 16 levels. 16? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I did not remember doing that. And if I think if I tried to do that consciously, I would have gone crazy. Uh, but yeah, so these these two features, um, especially in the epics, are very prominent. And I think the entire culture is permeated by these structures. Um, I mean, the, one really interesting thing about the Mahabharata is this um, belief about it, that you can start reading it anywhere and then wind your way around to where you started and it'll have the same effect. Right. Yeah. So the the... The circular nature of it is kind of built into uh, its reception. Mm. I I really didn't know that. That's uh, fascinating stuff. So um, yeah, coming. So let's stay on Sacred Games because every I think every writer out there now wants a Netflix series. I mean, it used to be oh get the Hollywood film deal, <laughs> but now I feel like people almost would rather have a TV series um, right, right. on Netflix or you know Amazon Prime or soon to be Disney or Apple or many of these new um, you know uh, places. So tell us a bit about you know how how did Sacred Games become a, a Netflix series? And I guess any tips because you know we can't. And right. no one can replicate anyone else's journey, but anything right. that you think, oh, well, that, you know, that really helped. 
Um, so the book was published in India in 2006 and came out um, in, in the United States in 2007. And even before it was published, um, there were uh, there was interest in, in getting an option on the book. An option meaning that whoever gets an option has the ability to then try and get it produced within a certain length of time. Um, and so one of the parties that was that wanted to option the book was a very, very renowned uh, uh, film production company from Los Angeles. And I was in LA and I had a meeting with one of their principals and he was, you know, really, really eager to do a movie. And I'm like, I don't know how you're going to make a movie out of a 900 page book, especially this one, because it has this, <laughs> you know, at least dual timelines with many other narratives running between. So unless you're going to make three films, I don't understand how you're going to do this, but I felt like I really admired the work they were doing. And so I signed on the dotted line and they hired this, uh, apparently this very uh, prominent screenwriter in England who then worked on it a couple of years and then finally gave up <laughs> because there was no way to uh, to reduce this into a, even a three-hour film. Uh, and I felt for him, right? I mean, it, it, he had been set up for to this craziness. Uh, and so then it sort of, uh, I stopped thinking about it. Um, and then uh, in one of these sort of uh, happy moments, um, there was a producer in my agent's office in New York and and um, she was talking to him about some other books. And then she said, well, I'm not that interested in any one of these. What else you got? So then he said, well, how about Sacred Games? And and she went off and read it and she wanted to do it. So um, then uh, we, that person and I and a writer um, worked together on the project. And then um, we did the rounds of the studios in Los Angeles um, and we we spent two years in development hell with AMC. <laughs> and, <laughs> and for those of you who don't know what development hell is, is where you're in this sort of um, limbo state where you haven't gone uh, gotten a green light for a production and you get notes from executives and you keep doing versions of episodes and sending them back. Uh, so finally, anyway, that didn't work out. And then it, by that time, it became clear to me that trying to do this this particular project with uh, sort of an American base wouldn't actually work. Uh, the impetus had to come out of India, and the people who need to who who were going to do it needed to be Indian and familiar with the culture and the landscapes that the story was actually set in. Uh, so then uh, I split up with my former partners, and during all this uh, these tours of LA, um, I had met with some people at Netflix, and then they came back. Um, and through a kind of triangular discussion with them and a company in Bombay, um, the final agreement was made, and that turned out to be an extremely happy event. Um, so I, I guess I should, I mean, it's obvious, but I should say that this happened for me because I already had two books behind me because Sacred Games got a fairly prominent publication uh, in India, in the UK, and in the United States. So there were people who were already interested. I didn't have to do too much to actually make it happen until we started doing the LA um, uh, journeying. Mm. I think for, for somebody who's, who's not in that position, the problem as always, and even in publishing is one of access, right? How are you going to get your story, your novel or your screenplay on the desk of somebody who can actually make a decision about it? Um, so, and, and like in publishing, um, studios get, you know, hundreds. I wouldn't be surprised if it's thousands of pitches a month, right? Mm -hmm. uh, things being directed at them. So in terms of access, the way to do it is, of course, the old fashioned um, network of contacts and nepotism, right? If you have a cousin who knows somebody in L.A. who knows an exec in a studio or in Bombay, that's one way to get your work in, in the door, at least, as it were, right? And then if you have an agent, usually that's the most useful and most productive, right? Uh, because the agent um, will know people um, who in this network who are the right readers for your work, right? So um, in, in, in publishing, this happens all the time, right? Like uh, if you send in a manuscript, part of the agent's job and value is to know who's the right reader for this. 
which editor has taken books like this over the last 10 years and made big successes out of them. That's the person person I should send this to uh, with the recommendations and they'll be likely to read it. Um, so I think as always, it's much harder if you're on the outside, right? You've got to engineer your way in somehow. And a lot of that depends on happenstance and luck as well. You know, mm -hmm. being in the right place at the right time with the right manuscript and suddenly, you know, the finger of the goddess reaches down and touches you on the head and you're in. I mean, that's what it has felt like to me at times. Yeah, well, uh, and that's certainly an emotional roller coaster because, of course, you thought it was going to happen and it didn't happen. And then you did all this work and then it didn't happen. And, and I also think, like you mentioned timing, Netflix, you, you got Netflix at a point when they were looking outside America. They knew right. that their subscribers were starting to slow down in the US and they were looking yeah. to grow the market around the world right and now there's a lot more foreign language and you know films set outside the US but probably five years ago there weren't there, there were very few right absolutely I mean I think that's so true <clears throat> and and you know just the 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 presence of this golden age of series television is amazing right because you get the time now over one or two or three or four seasons to really expand a story out into the length that it deserves. Um, the other thing I should say about Netflix and their their incredible model is that uh, they don't care what language you make a story in, right? And I won't name them, but I had meetings with people in LA where it was clear that the idea of a story not just set in another part of the world, <laughs> people by mostly brown people, mm. uh, but also the idea of making a series, an expensive series in a language other than English was really uh, frightening for them. And the brilliant thing about Netflix for us is that they let us reproduce that multilingual landscape of India in all its glory, right? Yeah. Uh, and and uh, I think if you're not an Indian, you probably won't experience this, but there are people, entire scenes between two characters who are speaking a language other than Hindi or English also, right? So it's multilingual also in the Indian sense. Uh, and so then some Indian uh, viewers have to switch to subtitles just for those scenes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but that's the way we exist. And it's been such a great uh, experience being able to do that. That is great for creative purposes. And it's funny because we have noticed, oh, look, they're suddenly saying English words. And, yeah. you know, I know that in some languages, English words are used because there aren't other words for those words. They might be a new technological word or something. Right. Um, but it was, it was quite, it was like, oh, that's, that's very cool. So I'm glad you've explained that because I didn't realise that there were these multiple languages. Yeah. But what, one question, um, you, you keep saying Bombay, which I thought we uh, now yeah. should say Mumbai. For people who don't understand the, the difference or why, can you explain that? Right. Well, so it, Bombay was the old uh, um, English name, right? So when I was growing up, depending on which language you're using, you would use a different um, term, right? Mm. So in English, you would say Bombay. In Hindi, you would say Bombay. In the local language, Marathi, you would say Mumbai. Um, and there's always been a kind of um, controversy about what the quote-unquote original name of the place was, right? So one uh, argument, historical argument, goes that there was a goddess named Mumba Devi who was worshipped by the fisher people who lived there, um, um, from time immemorial, and that's why it's called Mumbai. The other story is that the Portuguese came and saw this huge, uh, very good natural harbor, and they called it Bombay, good harbor, right? And mm -hmm. that's where the name comes from. So the name, um, as is often the case uh, in India, um, uh, has been re has been returned, as it were, to its origins uh, in an effort to get rid of colonial era names. Um, and so what happens now, again, and especially for people like me who grew up in the pre-official Mumbai phase, that when we're talking in English, um, Bombay sort of springs automatically from the <laughs> lips. If I'm speaking in Hindi, I'll say Bombay. And if I'm talking to a local Marathi person, I might say Mumbai. Uh, so it's, again, this great richness of language and, and layers of history right uh, over each other. 
Oh, I love it. And, you know, I, I make no secret on the show. I'm such a fan of India. <laughs> and <laughs> and in, in fact, you know, I've always said to my husband, I would move there like in a flash, you know, because um, I think as an English person, we have, I, and obviously um, there's some cultural difficulties with our history <laughs> because right, of the right. British Raj. But I think also there's a lot of positive aspects that, you know, Indian people feel about Britain as well as, um, and I've always felt very welcomed. I've never felt, you know, that, that there's any issue um but yeah so sort of on that a lot of people would love to sell more books in india so you know i have a book destroyer of worlds mm. which is set almost entirely in india based on my travels and um i did actually work with an agent at one point to do a kind of you know potentially a, a film thing um which didn't didn't happen obviously but um i wondered what, what do you think are the best ways for people to reach uh, readers in India. Obviously, we can just publish on Amazon.in, um, right. but I think ebooks are still quite small. So, what what would you recommend? Um, again, it's that age old access question, right? Uh, I think the best way is to get an Indian publisher interested so that they actually republish it in India. Um, I think the the uh, publishing and self publishing it um, is always an option, but even self-publishing within the United States, for instance, the trouble is how do you get the word out there that you've got this book out, right? Mm. So so the trick always is, um, I, I think the trick would be to get an Indian publisher committing to actually putting out the book locally and then you know, sending out review copies, doing the newspaper sort of and magazine approach, that kind of thing. Um, but the Indian publishers, as uh, like every other publishers, all other publishers in the world, uh, uh, have this overwhelming flood of submissions coming their way. So again, it's the gatekeepers who make the difference, right? So again, the agents come into play. Um, again, if you have a, a kind of sideways sideways connection to somebody in the business, there you can use that. And, and I, I know this sounds kind of depressing and <laughs> extremely <laughs> cynical to say, but it's just the way things are structured, right? And not just in publishing or movies, but uh, I think in other industries as well. Um, finding your way to people who can make decisions, I've realized as I get older, is like <laughs> half the struggle in life. Right? Oh, yeah, which is why, you know, I love self-publishing so much. It's like Because you basically waited 13 years from publication in India to having Sacred Games out there, um, which is, you know, a lot of people think, oh, I'll publish a book, get a movie deal and it'll be out next year. <laughs> But right, I mean, right, right. it takes years. I think Lee Child said 20 yeah. years for Jack Reacher. Um, you know, these yes. things take time. So if I think maybe the tip is if you decide you want to do something, then you have to work out who to get to know. And it might take a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. No, and I, I, I should say I'm, I'm, I haven't done it myself, but I'm fascinated by the difference um, that self-publishing is making. Um, just in terms of the numbers that one can squeeze out of Amazon on how many self-published books they sell and so forth is amazing. Um, and But I guess the, the, the other half of that story is how do you get then get an audience to actually notice that you're doing this, right? And then there's, I think for the writer at least and for the reclusive writer like me is – you have to maintain a public presence through social media, right? And, and all of this stuff that you have to do to maintain a dialogue and get people to know who you are, uh, which traditionally has been done by through other means by the traditional publishers. Um, so I'm, I'm fascinated by that, but I think also that it, it also requires an enormous amount of hard work and really strategic thinking, right? Yes. Uh, from what I can see of it. Yeah, you basically have to run a business uh, to right. be successful in self-publishing, you have to be a writer and a publisher and a marketer <laughs> and all, all, yes. of, all of the above. Um, so uh, I want, so let's get into the writing because you have this background in software engineering when you were, you know, get working so that you could fund your writing habit. <laughs> Right, um, yes. And now you've actually founded a startup designing writing software, which is Granthica. So tell us about this. Why Why did you decide to do this and why might authors consider it? Well, uh, so this actually began um, uh, when I was just starting to write Sacred Games. That was my third work of fiction. And I knew fairly early on that it was going to be a large, largish book. It has a 60-year timeline. 
um, many, many speaking characters, two main narrative threads. And I'd already experienced in those other two books the amazing amount of work and cognitive effort it takes to keep all your facts straight, right? Uh, who was born when? How old would they be in a scene in 1984 and then in 1993? Um uh, when did that person travel from this place to the other, right? So it's this enormous amount of detail. And then your background notes, right? You keep, uh, maybe you keep your notes in a note-taking program. You have a timeline to manage all that other stuff. And it just feels like manual double-entry bookkeeping, right? Every time you make a change in your manuscript, oh, I've got to go and change that in my timeline. But then... What other scenes depend on that change all the way through the next 400 pages, right? And if you're using a traditional word processor, the only way you have of figuring this out is doing search, right? Mm -hmm. So, And that doesn't find, always find the references. And, and it used to drive me crazy. And, and I, was, I kept thinking, I'm spending all this time on this detail chasing, which I should be worrying about my story and my language. Right? That's what I want to do. Um, so... Uh, I thought surely somebody's written a software to manage all this. And I looked around and nobody had. Um, and then I got uh, absorbed in the writing of the book, but it kept um, annoying me. And so after the book was finished in that downtime, um, I started to think about how could you do this in a better way than having, you know, four programs and five uh, notebooks, fat notebooks in which you're keeping notes and the hand-drawn timeline on the wall. Um, and it turns out to be a really hard problem attaching knowledge to text, as I discovered, much harder than one would think it is. And I have, a, as you can probably tell already from what I've said, I have an obsessive nature, and usually that's turned out to be a blessing. Uh, so I, I obsessed and researched this problem for, I think, the next 10 years, more or less. <laughs> <laughs> and one night, just before I fell asleep, I thought, I think I might know how to do this. And then woke up in the morning and it didn't seem crazy. Uh, so <laughs> I actually started, I wrote it down and uh, I was encouraged by a friend to write down a software proposal. Uh, but I had the idea at a sort of 30,000 foot level um, and my uh, software programming skills are pretty workmanlike and this was way above my pay grade. Uh, but through a happy coincidence, I ended up meeting my co-founder, uh, Boris Yerdanov, who was one of these tech geniuses. Um, and so then we founded this company to try and create this program uh, where it's obviously an editor, right? So you write your manuscript in it, but your character notes, for instance, are one keystroke away, So right? So you put your cursor within the character's name, you press one key and it jumps you right to all your notes about him or her. And then you press one more keystroke to come right back to where you're writing. Um, and the same applies to things like uh, events and, and, um, and locations and so forth. So it's, it's the entire structure of your fictional world is contained in a way that you can actually intelligently parse it and understand it. And that uh, for things like, you know, if you are looking at an event, um, you can see every place in your manuscript where you refer to that event so that, um, if you're trying to look for dependencies between things, you can easily find them. And then um, the really exciting part of it for us is that we've built it from the ground up to be amenable to reasoning. And what that means is that you can say that, uh, you know, the inquest must follow the murder by um, eight days and that uh, you can also apply the cons constraint that the inquest must follow the murder. So that if in some later stage of, you know, tiredness, you try and move the inquest up before the murder, it'll warn you. Um, <laughs> that's, and, that's amazing. <laughs> do you really want to do this? Uh, and then um, so right now, the, the intelligent part of it is mainly confined to um, uh, to events, but we're going to extend it further. Right. So that uh, in a future version, if you say Kamala marries Tom the system will be able to work out that now John is Kamala's brother-in-law, right? So it'll, it'll be able to show you relationships and then reason along these branches of deductions. Uh, so, so it's very, very ambitious, but, but it, 
I shouldn't make it sound complex, right? That's been my worry right from the start is that I don't want to struggle with a tool while I'm trying to concentrate on the story and the language. Mm. Uh, so we've spent a lot of effort in trying to make it supple and, and easy to use and, and immediately make sense uh, without, without putting an additional burden on the part of the writer um, as she tries to write her story. Yeah. Just one question there. If I, so if, because I'm always doing this, if I write that my character has blue eyes, will it warn me if I try and make them have brown eyes at another point? <laughs> yes. I mean, that's not quite yet, but that's something that we're really thinking about hard and we are going to implement it shortly, right? Oh, that's great. Cause I just, oh, that always happens. Oh, I've got like yeah. a scar on a left arm and then later on it ends up being <laughs> yeah. on the right arm. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. No, and you know, Tolstoy did it to Anna Karenina, if I if I'm remembering remembering. Oh correctly. well, there we go. All the greats yeah. do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and and then you know, I guess the the thing that we're trying to do is to think in intelligent ways about problems like this, because if you're in a sci-fi universe, right, you can the the person get can get new eyes which go to gold or silver even. Yeah, or right? they can do so, an autopsy or whatever quite quickly yeah. on an alien. Who knows? Right. <laughs> I know, and and in in uh, my favorite sci-fi writer is Ian M. Banks. Oh yes, uh, he's amazing. And in his books, people can change species, right? <laughs> so so some some current uh, pr- sort of story writing programs, they they have this ability. You can say, you know, a writer is a uh, uh, character is six feet tall, and and he has blue eyes. But I was thinking, wait, like he hasn't been six feet tall since he was two years old, right? <laughs> so if you write a childhood flashback scene, how am I going to manage that? So what we're trying to do is, is make it make the system flexible enough to accommodate switch, uh, changing characteristics as well. Wow. So that's interesting. I've been writing in Scrivener for um, 10 years, pretty much. And I love Scrivener, um, but it does definitely doesn't have that timeline aspect and it doesn't have um, that dependencies or any kind of you know, intelligence level that you're adding in. Um, and the other software I was thinking of is Story Shop, um, which I know is kind of still in a developmental process. But again, that doesn't have those aspects that you've mentioned. So it's really interesting where you've taken it. And I think you've, it sounds like you've come to that because you write such epic books. There's, <laughs> there is, I mean, I struggle, I, I write a lot shorter than you, but I struggle to hold 70,000 word story in my head at once, you know, so it, it, these much bigger epics and series, long running series, also um, very important. So where, if people want to have a look at Granthika, where do they go to? Um, there's our main website, which is granthika.co, G-R-A-N-T-H-I-K-A.co. And then if you want to read a little bit about what we're doing, we also have a documentation site, which is docs.granthika.co. Um, mm. So, and maybe just explain the name because um, it's quite an uh, unusual name. Oh, so so Granthika in in Sanskrit means narrator, uh, one who holds and understands the knots of time, K N O T S, uh, and it's got an interesting sort of etymological base uh, in that uh, Granth uh, is book, which comes from another root which means knot, right, or tie, K N O T. So, so the idea is that that uh, what narrators do is that they set up uh, these narratives through time, which are tied together by event, uh, by events. Oh, I love that! It's so beautiful. Uh, I'm glad you explained <laughs> it. So, um, where can people find you and your books online? Oh, that's my personal website. Is just my name, Vikramchandra.com, and it's got a bunch of stuff up there. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, Vikram. That was great. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. Thanks. So I hope you found the interview with Vikram interesting today. And I was particularly fascinated by his use of language and how he managed to use it in the Sacred Games TV show. And definitely listen without dubbing if you watch on Netflix. I I just love it. I think it's so interesting. Plus the idea of circular storytelling and the difference between cultures is fascinating. So I hope you got lots of ideas uh, today. 
Next week, I'm talking about how to write your darkness with David Wright, one of the co-writers at Sterling and Stone, known to many of you as Dave from Johnny, Sean and Dave at the Story Studio podcast, uh, previously the self-publishing podcast. And I know many of you know the guys. And uh, I'm really looking forward to this interview. Um, We are talking about turning your darkness into stories and uh, also some ideas about writing for screen green budgets, which is a really interesting point, and much more. So happy writing, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes, available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.